hear ye! The Parliament of Geek shall now come to order! And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Parliament of Geeks. The one place in the internet that, that gives you one simple answer. Be ye weeb, or be ye scrub. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in the temple. We have the man guiding you through all of your VTubers, and the, and the man who um, peer pressures me into watching Critical Role every week. Good brother Shades. I do no such thing! I do no such thing! <laughs> Won't even try that, you son of a bitch! <laughs> I had to... I had to... I had, to, I had to mix up the intro somehow. It's I get I, I do not need your fans calling me a Matt Mercer stan, okay? No, that's not going to happen. The, wor the worst that the worst that's going to the worst that's going to happen is ju is just somebody making the peer the peer pressure gag. Um, <laughs> if if anyone in Mildred's audience unironically called you a stan of anything, shades, we would just give them a wedgie. <laughs> Either, either think, that or I, I just... Unironically, you stand at all. Yeah. Um, if I, I am a stand or a simp or anything, I am a kid of you, Coco simp, and I'm proud of it, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> kid you, Kai forever! But, with... And, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the man of a thousand runes, the evangelist of the monastery, and the officially titled Bane of My Existence... Good, good brother Xanatrix. You can find the official title on Twitter. The shitty ass bird app. <laughs> oh. the fuck I like how I like how anime refers to Twitter stories as bird app bullshit on his channel. <laughs> oh, so uh, such a fitting name. Yeah, and it ro and I love alliteration. <laughs> Just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> now. It will obviously. It's still going to. There is the next major one that we had planned is still going to be a while, but the but we are developing a bit of a tiers and tent poles approach with things, where in the midst of some of the larger projects, which we are in the middle of and will be for, will be for a few weeks yet, we'll be introducing some material that we have already seen before and don't need to rewatch. Unle or rather, don't need to rewatch for the watch party setup that we have. But are things that we are familiar enough with that we can still cover. And for this particular entry, well, it's very fortuitous that, that we're recording this at night in my particular time zone, and probably yours as well, Shades. Indeed. Because... The world is a vampire. And that is uh, as far as I'm going with that joke. I was about to say, <laughs> referencing that song, why not? Oh hell, me and Maddie do it all the fucking time. <laughs> but for the for this particular Geek Watch, we are cover we are covering a film. We are parliament, covering a monk, for this particular yeah, parliament. Parliament. <laughs> hey, in in my defense, we haven't done we haven't done that many parliaments, so give it some time to set it settle in. <laughs> I'm going to keep correcting you as we go. Yeah, I know it's a it's a work in progress. It's like trying to have me catch a ball with my right hand. Don't you bring up ambidexterity to me right now? <laughs> <laughs> I know you were thinking it. Don't. What can't take a one two from the left and the right? <laughs> Phrasing. I know what I said. <laughs> uh, I love I get out here. <laughs> now that being said, that being said, for this one, it's another it's another instance of classics that any that any anime fan worth their salt should be covering, in one form or another. I'm sure, and. My disappointment is immeasurable at the lack of any tubers covering this kind of thing. Or rather, I should say my disappoint I'm not I can't be disappointed in that regard when when it comes to some anitubers, my expectations are already pretty damn low as it is. 
You know who you are. The modern shit, and they don't have time for classics, but that's just the nature of the algorithm. Fuck you, YouTube. Well, that's what ha that's what happens when you try and chase trends. I have I am under no such predilection. Or am I? It's a very liberating experience to be able to do whatever the fuck you want, and not worry about, um, not worry about an algorithm, or worry about, or worry about getting canceled. This is the reason I can play Ghostwire Tokyo, a brand new game, and Super Robot Wars W from 2007 at the same time. Figuratively, not literally. I've done it literally. It was kind of weird. I'd imagine so. But, with that said, this week's episode of the Parliament is all about Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust. And, before we even get into this film, which, I think the, the only other person I can think of who covered it in a great amount of detail is Bonsai Pop, who, who um, I actually consider one of the better Anitubers out there, largely, be, largely because... He ha largely because he has a more of a character study leaning with his work. Mm. Um, he also provide one of the best summa summations of Taoism in his coverage of Outlaw Star, which I highly recommend. Or as best as you can when ancient Chinese secret is ancient Chinese secret. Ancient Chinese secret! We're not getting to Finn, that'll be for later. <laughs> For those of you who know, you know. If you don't know, you'll know soon enough. But Vampire Hunt, unlike a lot of projects that we've that we've covered here and elsewhere that are ba that are based on manga, Vampire Hunter D is is instead based on a light novel or light novel series. The light novel series by um. Hideyuki, Hideyuki Kikuchi, which has gone on, which has multiple volumes, and a few co and a few manga and comic spin-offs over the years, including one comic spin-off that recently got kickstarted by a, by a bunch of French artists. I would go this into the unique relationship that manga has with France, but that's a whole other story. Just to let you know. The newest novel in this over 30-year-old novel series was released November of last year. Mm -hmm. So, Kuchi is a prolific writer and has not ever fucking stopped Vampire Hunter D, I swear to God. Would you say that he's the Japanese Sanderson? Oh... <laughs> I think he's more prolific than Sanderson, technically, Monk. He's just got more time on him, though, so, yeah. Just in the sense of being a goddamn machine. Oh, yeah. No, I, I am the machine! I think a better comparison, he is the novel equivalent to uh, Araki. The guy just doesn't stop. What a coincidence. Both of them have done stories with vampires. <sighs> it's like I made that comparison for a reason. <laughs> Nah, Shade's doing things for reasons? Perish the thought. No. Nah. <laughs> but for the for in order to set the stage before we even get to the film, Zan, I'd like you to pr I'd like you to play the role once again of the evangelist and give the skinny regarding the character of Vampire Hunter D in the world uh, he inhabits. Hold that thought for a minute, Monk. Have we forgotten something? Oh yes, I've I. It's been it's um it's been so long since this became a habit that it ha that it hasn't quite sunk in. So before we even get to that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is time to rise for our drinking anthem. School, motherfucker. Oh! And now, ladies and gentlemen. 
gentlemen, it is time to sound the yellow horn! Thank you for reminding me. I get, again, it's been... Even though that was a weekly thing for months and years, um, getting back into the swing of things is a work in progress. Yes. Getting you back into fighting shape, as it were. <laughs> Gotta stick out that ring rust, boys! <laughs> <laughs> but I will go ahead and uh, now play that role of evangelist you have me in, or I have myself in. I'm not quite sure yet. <clears throat> Vampire Hunter D, the character, the person. D is a half-human, half-vampire known as a Dampeel or a Dampir, or depending on which uh, translation you get, a Dunpeel. Uh, within the post-apocalyptic future of Earth, and yes, it is Earth, it's like twelve or 13,000 years in the future of Earth, where there have been vampires that rose, a giant war with vampires, and vampires that have all, well, gone to shit. The nobles are few and far between. D is on a mission to essentially kill every noble. Uh, with the idea being that no creature like himself should exist. He does not believe that a, a Dampir should exist because it's a cursed existence. Neither vampire nor human. Shunned by one, uh, others seek to kill him or use him for whatever purposes they can to try and walk the sun themselves. Now, D is a little different than other Dampir, though. D uh, seems to have all of the strengths of a Dampir with none of the debilitating weaknesses besides sunsickness. And even then... His sun sickness compared to others is quite ticklish, I guess is the best word. It Normally, a Dampir who suffers sun sickness by being out in the sun too long has to bury themselves in dirt out of the sun for weeks. And they can't stay in the sun for very long. Whereas D, he buries himself for four or five hours and he's fine. And he can also stay out in the, lo in the sun longer. In addition to this... In his left hand, he has his ever-present butler, Left Hand. That's its name. Ah, oh, sharky motherfucker, too. Uh, this, this guy serves sort of as the um, narrator for D's internal monologue. D himself does not have an internal monologue. So we get Left Hand making commentary about things D is thinking and the types of, of actions D would take. As sort of, but he's also sort of an unreliable narrator in that respect because he's also a fucking, you know, a, I guess technically a homunculus made by the Barbaroi to be the best homunculus ever and then attached to D. It's long story, read the books. I'll put it that way. Yeah. But, also, motherfucker is a troll. He likes to fuck with D every chance he can. Mm hmm. But both through the fact that D is different from other Dampir due to plot elements not explored in this movie, and the fact that he has left hand, uh, he has a much higher survivability. I mean, if left hand eats the ether of the four Hellenistic elements, literally eating dirt, fire, water, and the air, he can actually regenerate D. Mm -hmm. On top of that, D has access to magical powers that only full nobles usually have. And D is at the same or higher levels of strength than nobles. And by strength, I don't just mean pure raw physical strength, but speed, durability, all of it. In, in short, D is the perfect anti-vampire weapon if he applies himself that way. He could just as easily be the perfect anti-human menace if he ever loses himself. And uh, that's actually reflected in his philosophy of if I ever become a scourge to humanity, I too will be hunted down. And that's that. No, no nonsense about him. 
He is very devoted to that cause of going forward and getting rid of the nobles that are bringing this scourged humanity because of a perceived superiority. Though, mm-hmm. so, this might also have something to do with his ancestry. Though, he's not who you might... Th- the, the, name, the letter D might imply something, and well... You're technically, you might technically be correct, but not in the way you think. He's not the man himself, but, uh, let's just say some nobles speculate he shares his blood. Fortunately, that's one of those things that I don't think any of the novels outright answer. Actually, you're, you're wrong there, Monk. One of the novels does outright answer what D is. Okay, my, okay, my bad. If, if I might. Go ahead. Even though it's not explored in this movie, what D is is a science experiment by the sacred ancestor himself, as the nobles call him. The sacred ancestor being Vlad Dracultepes, or Count Dracula, the progenitor of all vampires in this world. He is the experiment to combine his own lineage with the lineage of humanity to create a lineage that can unite them, at least initially. Um, And he's the only success. All the others came out warped, twisted, or otherwise uh, maligned, and the sacred ancestor was forced to kill them. So, there you have it. He's a half-genetic clone of Dracula and a human woman. Uh, and, and believed to be, of course, if, you've re- if you know your Dracula stories, Mina Harker. In some cases, it's it's implied, but I don't think that that one is actually that one confirmed. Actually confirmed, but it's been implied that it's Mina Harker. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it, because, because of this, though, D has a very complicated thought process when it comes to his involvement with his "quote unquote" father. And I know some people. Might, I know some people might. Spr- might bring up um, Alucard, Alucard and the and whether the, and whether there's some similarities. There really isn't. No, they're completely different people. I would, <laughs> I would say I would say Alucard has a stronger sense of humanity, and by Alucard, I'm of course referring to Adrian Fahrenheit's Tepes, uh, than D does, for lack of a better term. Yes. D does not see himself as a child of either world. Um, And as such, he sees himself as outcast, no matter where he is. Even, as we'll discuss later in this movie, when he is welcomed by some humans. Mm -hmm. That being... Now, that being said, one of the... One of the other things that's fascinating with the... um, the story of Vampire Hunter D is the world that it takes place in because you have the, instead of being a period piece or even what one might expect from a post-apocalyptic piece, it's a piece of many periods. Some of them look look a little bit more like um, like Dark Ages Europe. Some of them with far more futuristic technology. Some of them looking a little bit like the Wild West, and a lot of them. A little of a little of multiple columns all at once, that um, that gestalt fantasy that I've to- that I've talked about in the past. I personally dubbed this type of world as gothic, uh, post cyberpunk, technically. Which, given the technical design, is cer- is certainly the case. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that. The light novels had had their fair share of art, art that was done by the legend himself, Yoshitaka Amano. Uh, yes, the art of the light novels by Amano is superb, as much of Amano's work tends to be. He wasn't always the guy doing Final Fantasy art, and he still isn't just the guy doing Final Fantasy art. No, it's just some of his best work comes from that franchise but 
he's got a few other winners under his belt and a few losers as well, but we won't be tough. But that's more about how people adapted his work, not the work itself. Yeah. Now, this is now Bloodlust is not the first attempt to do Vampire Hunter D in film form. There was, of course, the mid the mid '80s film, which I think came out in '86. 85 I think 85. it was which um was certainly it was certainly a groundbreak was certainly a groundbreaker in in it when it came to horror in anima in animation for its time but I'd hesitate to say that it holds up all that well with age now it's a bit of a snore fest to try to sit through that movie if you tr uh, in this day and age it, but even back then it wasn't exactly very high paced the I think the the real issue was uh, it it almost attempted to adapt too slavishly in some parts parts um, because you are adapting from a light novel. There are periods of downtime. Mm -hmm. Downtime exists in in written media a lot, so that people can ruminate, come upon new discoveries and theories as part of that rumination. Uh, that's a pretty common tactic, and it's a widely used literary one. Uh, and the, the 85 movie definitely took some of that downtime a little too far. And even, even with, even without the downtime, I've made it clear in the past that adapting from one medium to another, doing so in a slavish manner is going to create problems. It always creates problems. This is the reason why I keep bringing up Cormac MacArthur's The Road as my portrait example for this kind of thing. Because that is something that trying to that if you were to try and to adapt it into a two hour or even a ninety minute movie, you'd have to make some changes. And they try to go slavish with it and the inevitable happens. Indeed. And now with Bloodlust, well, we have well. Um, this is adapting the this is adapting the third novel, Demon Death Case. Although, oddly enough, it's not as violent as as Demon Death Case was, which is which is saying something. But this one is far more star studded compared to the original because, first off. The animation is helmed by Madhouse, with some help from Filmlink International, BMG Japan, Movic, Good Hill Vision, and Soft Capital. And they also did the right thing and tried to keep their art style as close to Amano's art as possible. I would say it's a halfway point between Amano's artwork and the, and the artwork from the person who was director and storyboarder. Um, Yoshiaki Kawajiri of Wicked City and Ninja Scroll fame. Mm -hmm. And you definitely see a lot of that style in this movie, but it's done very well. It is very well, very clean for its time. I mean, compare it, you know, compare it to today's digital animation. Obviously, it's got its age shows, but not in a way that makes it feel unwatchable. Just something that just kind of has a classic touch to it. At one point, I do remember doing a watch party of the, of this film on the server. In fact, this that was I'd say about two years ago. And one of the things I remember having a bit having a bit of a rant about is the value of shading, and how certain animators, especially certain animators stateside, seem to have forgotten this crucial factor. Because at the same time, somebody had done a few edits to. Um, Ultimate Spider-Man, putting in actual shading, and it looks so much better. And I don't even like Ultimate Spider-Man. I thought it was a poor man's Teen Titans. But Madhouse, say what you say what you will about Madhouse's curse of being of being unable to finish things in the last few years. I would say they. I would say they understood the potential of digital animation far more smoothly than a lot of other contemporaries at that time. Mm -hmm. 
is you look at a lot of anime f from I'd say 2000 to 2004 ish, and I know this is something we've brought up in the past, but it bears repeating when you're dealing with animation from this time. This was a transitional period for the for animation as a whole, where a lot of people were shifting away from analog methods and into digipaint, and not everybody was able to make a smooth transition at first. No, but Madhouse, during this time, was putting out probably some of the best anime of that period. I mean, we're talking stuff like Paranoia Agent, Chobits, Monster. Like, they were putting out, you know, some high-end stuff here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's the reason, and a lot of a lot of what helped them was the fact that they had a very strong understanding of how to do shading in that digital form. They still have that understanding. Mm -hmm. You just have to look at One Punch Man Season 1 to see that. Oh, yeah. And it's if, if it sounds like it's a bit repetitive of me to harp on shading, it's, bec it's because it's one of those things that you don't that you take for granted when you're when it's being done proper but once you see the difference that just a little bit of shading can put to animation you can't unsee how important it is and especially for something that tries to set its moods as much through its uh its settings as it does through its characters and other themes uh, vampire hunter d needs needs that correct shading absolutely now, that be that being said, diving diving headfirst into va into Vampire Hunter D. Um, first off, I th I'd say I'd say that Bloodlust has the coldest of cold opens that one could ask for. <laughs> before <laughs> even that. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I have to be a petty motherfucker. <laughs> Wait, I... and that's different from any other day, how? <laughs> yeah, it's a day that ends in Y, Monk. <laughs> <laughs> they constantly refer to D and similar half-vampire hybrids as Dunpeels. That is not the fucking name. I can only assume, because of the fact that it's writ that it's written that way in the opening crawl, I can only assume that this is a case of English. It is yeah. because in in Japanese they say "dompiru," and it is an N sound, just like with the word "hammer" being "hanma." Um, it it is an N sound, even when they mean an M sound there, mm -hmm. and it is it, it for the Japanese that is a translation of "dampir." to Dumpiru. It's the same word to them. But then it was translated back and you have Dun, sounds like Dun, Piru, P-O because you generally see er, the, the Ru sound as an L rather than as an R. Yeah, th this is a common thing with a lot of Japanese to English translations, especially back in the day when we quite hadn't quite figured out how to properly translate certain words. It, you know, the Jay-Z romanization, RL romanization, those were common problems with it comes to stuff like this. So it's not surprising this happened, even though it still kind of sucks. Yeah. But like, like I said, that is that is as petty as I'll get when it comes to this kind of thing. It's just something I can't quite ignore. Uh, I'll extend your pettiness just a little bit more because I can hear in the background... That's not how they end the word vampire when it's transliterated. Yes, they say bonpaya. But even though vampire ends in R-E and dampir ends in R, and they both make the er sound that is actually quite unique to English, um, the, the fact that they decided to use a dampiru is a, a little more because that R is at the end of the word. <laughs> Now, with the, now with that in mind, I'd be remiss if I did if I also didn't point out the fact that they start that um 
They started production in 97, but the film didn't come out until 2000. And given the, given the quality of the animation, it certainly shows. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very clear that, that Bloodlust was a, was a, uh, a labor of love with how good this animation is. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason why I say that it's the coldest of cold opens is because, first off, you have that, you have, um, you have that, you have that opening shot and that, op- and that opening sting as sudden as it gets. <laughs> You mean where the entire fountain turns to ice? Well, not the f- not just the fountain turning to ice, but the the dog barking up a storm, but then dis- but then whimpering back, even with um, a couple stock sounds that they used. Yeah, um, they did some really good shit here. I'm gonna be honest. And the other. The other part that is that is just that that I find just as interesting is all is the plant life wilting and the and all the crosses um getting bent out of shape. Mm-hmm. And there's no shortage of crosses in the air in the opening area. Yeah, they want to make it clear that whoever whoever was at this place was wanting to make sure that kept trouble out, but trouble came in going. Yeah, you can't stop us. Mm-hmm. And of course, of course, the of course the whole the whole um thing of thing of the vampire kid, kidnapping in the middle of the night is a classic motif in gothic fantasy, and I will always appreciate little details that some people tend to forget when discussing vampires, namely not having a reflection. This is a one of those other vampiric weaknesses that D does not have. He does reflect. Mm-hmm. And after after that happens, we end up have we end up getting the expository expository bit about vampires ruling the night, but their numbers dwindling, and the intro and the introduction of the t- of the vampire hunter D title and. Something I find interesting is that when they do the tight when they do that little title plate, you don't get the bloodlust subtitle. We on, we only really get that from from say a movie poster or the box art. Yeah, and that's because bloodlust wasn't uh, wasn't exactly called bloodlust on the official title card um, because this was a story about. Vampire Hunter D. Mm-hmm. The only reason Bloodlust was added was to differentiate it from the 1985 movie. Mm-hmm. But of course, after that, we have the we have the whole thing of the most the most once the most one sided hire the most one sided and hostile hiring process in the history of hiring processes. <laughs> <laughs> I uh. I I love the fact that they're all freaking the fuck out. There's there's like at least six guys, seven guys on the roof aiming down rifles at D on upon his dark and stormy steed, which I will note here this is another part of why I say this is gothic post cyberpunk. His his horses are all cybernetic. Like they they're cyborgs. There's there's some some organic parts to them. And some very clearly mechanical parts to them, oh, yeah. and and we see later exactly how many organic parts one of his horses has. Hey. But even but he first off, um, I should note it is no easy feat to try and t- to try and convert Yoshitaka Amano's design work into an a- into an animated form. We've Min- seen examples of this. Yes. We already talked about Gibare on Geek Watch and e- and um there's a reason why even though he even though he's been a concept artist for Final Fantasy for years, why it was 
ultimately a smarter move to go with Nomura's art style instead of um, Amano's art style for FF7 onward. Yeah, trying to do Amano's art style in 3D, especially with Final Fantasy VII's very primitive graphics, at least by comparison to today, that would have been a disaster. Well, even even with modern tech, it's still it's still not easy to pull off. No. Well, Amano's Amano's artwork, if we're if we're gonna follow this thread to its conclusion, Amano's artwork is very uh, ephemeral and um ethereal it's it's a it's an artwork that seems surrealist without being surrealist artwork it's not yeah. something that is going to be easy to replicate at all anywhere mm -hmm. yeah that the bloodlust is probably the closest anyone has ever gotten to actually adapting his work and keeping it much of that feel there while still being somewhat contemporary it's it, it walks that tightrope very carefully but it's about as close as you're ever going to get with that without making it look completely ridiculous and to the surprise of absolutely no one i absolutely love d's design i always have oh yeah i mean that's i don't think there's a person in this call that doesn't like d's design <laughs> it, it captures the feel of Yes, he is part vampire. He's got the cape, he's got the outfit, he's got the pale face, and there's just this badassery to him for a guy that doesn't really like to consider himself a badass. He's just doing his thing, but he's going to make damn sure it gets done. If I ever got the chance to meet Kikuchi, to uh, talk with Kikuchi, I would ask him if he was ever at all influenced by Robert E. Howard's Solomon Kane work. Call it a gut feeling, if you will. I could see it. And yeah, a big part of that is certainly the hat. It's not a, it's not exactly a pilgrim hat, but it's not far off. That hat is baller, though. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. If nothing else, D has the drip. That is for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, drip for days on this motherfucker. Oh. I also feel bad for for anybody who ever tries to cosplay as D, as D whether, whether they've done it in the past or in the future. Um, and especially so if they end up trying to cosplay it in your neck of the woods, Shades. Oh, God, yeah. Because, yeah, the, the, this guy, the, 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 the outfit is, like, it's, it's simple in its design, but it's all black except for the inner lining of the cape. And... It just, it is a bulky thing. Especially the shoulder pads, they stick out a bit. And again, that hat, fucking Christ. Well, the hat will provide some damn good shade. <laughs> Give it that. Mm -hmm. but... I, I would like to note that that um, the design in, in Bloodlust is, is very close to the original. But Amato's artwork does have some additional detail. There are things like a little bit of gold trim on some parts of his cape. Um, I think it was actually a, the better idea to remove it for the movie. Yeah, because it crea it creates this kind of badass design to it. Like the, you see a guy like this walking into a room, you're paying attention to this guy. Mm -hmm. It's also very clear that this guy is probably like taller than Mildred or myself, and carries a sword taller than, or as tall as he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, he's a man yeah. after our own heart, monk. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to break my neck to look up at this guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly a short motherfucker. No. <laughs> but going in but going in, you ha it's revealed that he that he was called to that he was called to this location for the hiring process, and this is where we get our exposition as far as what we saw in the cold open. That uh, that um that her si that his sister, um Char um, Charlotte Elborn was abducted by the by the vampire Meyer Link. He's offered a he's offered a, a sack of gold as, as a down payment, and and he'll get the rest if he if he brings her back. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to note that 
when we say his sister, we're talking about Char- Charlotte's brother, Adam. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's Charlotte's father, John, that chooses to hire D. But this is where we have a bit of negotiation because at first he's like, no, it, no, by the time I get there, she may have been, she may have been bitten. It's like, well, then put her out of her misery. He's like, okay, I'll do it for double. Which the the mere thought, Adam merely going, how dare you is, al- is almost enough to get to get everybody up on top. Who's got, who's got a bunch of antiques ready, ready on D to, to consider firing. It takes the old man to get them to not to knock that shit off. Well, I mean, the old man shouts like he fucking screams. You better stand down, basically, because um, he didn't want literally all of his men and his son to die. He knows who he's dealing with here. <laughs> that and well, what? Well, if they start shooting, then then um, NAP com- NAP comes to mind. And look, you're not look. You're not going to be carrying around a sword like that if you don't know how to use it. Even if somebody's got bullets. Like I said, he didn't want his men to die. Plus, like I said, all the firearms were... As as a bit of a firearm enthusiast that um, Zan and I are, all those are <laughs> antiques. Yeah, those are... <laughs> Those are some pretty old 1800s looking, like 1890s looking post Civil War it's rifles. It's fucking Winchester rifles. Mm-hmm. Some were lever action. Let's be fair. Mm-hmm. It, these things ain't gonna do jack shit to this guy. Well, even, well, well, the bigger problem is even if you get even if you get a shot in, um, you're gonna get one shot in, and ha- and the time between them is gonna be glacially long with somebody who's that fast. Not to mention, even if they've got silver bullets because they're expecting someone who's part vampire, it's not going to work. Another fi- another weakness that Dampier normally have, that D does not, is while they are not deathly allergic to silver like vampires are, it does weaken them. Not so with D. Mm-hmm. Now, at the, of course, the other thing that's revealed is that there's some competition, namely the Marcus brothers. And the next scene that we get is base is basically one giant showcase for the Marcus family. Well, all but one of them. I mean, you can't really showcase him with the rest of them. That'd just be silly. Yeah. But you have Borgoff, who has the philosophy of all of the arrows. Shoot first, ask questions later. Otherwise known as, shoot them all and let God sort them out. Um, Nolts, who it who um is who is the he- who is the heavy of of the group, and if you put him in shadow, one would probably fit as a street samurai. Um, maybe may have troll DNA given his size, given his size and the fact that he's wielding a hammer that's probably four hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Kyle, who is tr- who is trying very hard to be a ninja. The edgiest edge that ever did edge, and that's saying something when our main character is a vampire dressed fully in black with a sword on his back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Layla, who who um is very much in the is very much in the archetype of the heroine character that you see a lot in Kawajiri's work. Um, she's also dressed differently than everyone else. Bright red bodysuit. Someone was watching Captain Harlock. Mm. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's not that far removed from the bodysuit that Kay had. I know. But this is a bodysuit that then also has a draped over half jacket. Wait. And a weird air cannon gun. Yeah, I, even, af- even after all these years with this film, I still have no idea what that what that thing is from what i've seen watching the one scene where we actually see what it's quote-unquote projectile is in the middle of the of the one area the little lakish area with the pillars like ruins Mm -hmm. um it looks like a giant 
air shockwave. I su- I suppose it could be worse. You could you could have kill you could have Killy's little gun. Little, right? Well, the well the gun itself is small, but then again, so was the noisy cricket. <laughs> My point exactly. Mm-hmm. But it it's also it's also a good it's also a good showcase. This is also where we have a good showcase for D skills as well, being able to ki- being able to catch that arrow and look good doing it in the process. And even look at back at them until after he caught the arrow. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, just shing. Now something I need to note. Uh, Burgoff somehow has semi-seeking arrows. Um, maybe this is bending the bullet before wanted. I don't know. But I mean, he like he uses his ears to listen. Here's the clopping hoofbeats of a horse. He's like, he's right there, and shoots it off, and it curves between uh different headstones and and tombs because they've been fighting a bunch of recently turned villagers in their own cemetery. Um, and, oh, and then D's just like, catch it in my left hand, because I don't even need to use my dominant hand. Mm-hmm. Now, the other, of course, the, of course, um, things, th- things do, con- things do continue on, and while, um, while there's a bit of professionalism, that professionalism between the two is very one-sided. Yeah, D's the only professional here. Because uh, these guys... I, for, I forget what the exact uh, exact um, proverb they use is, but I'll use one that I really like from Wuxia and Shansha novels. It's the proverb about, about the scroll, but go, but go on. The mantis stalks the cicada... Unaware that the Oriole is behind. They they imagine themselves the Oriole. They're the cicada. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but as as cool as the Marcus brothers are, uh, they are definitely the weakest characters that we see throughout the movie, combat-wise, that are combatants. Yeah. Now, the thing... The thing is, af- is afterwards... Um, and uh, I guess you can count this to tracking skills. Um, D ends up finding a very reflective resting house for va- for um, vampires, and has the ch- and has the chillest way of getting past security. Lots of rocks. <laughs> I, I actually, um, those lasers still should have shot at him. Is the thing. Mm-hmm. Um. The pendant he wears, though not explained in the movie, in in the novels, it is explained that that pendant makes him invisible to vampire countermeasures. Which, if that which that being the that being the case, I guess the only reason to to throw to throw the rocks around is just to show off. Distraction. Mm-hmm. Convince the vampire that there are more people there than there actually are. That's the, that's the it, the uh, feeling I always got about it. Yeah, and make them feel a threat that we to not want to deal with it. And it prob it probably would have worked if Le- if Layla hadn't sh- hadn't shown up packing. <laughs> if it weren't for that damn meddling kid. I mean, compared to D, anybody's a kid, but that's it, hardly material here. <laughs> granted, granted the. Granted, the packing in this ki- in this instance is a fucking bazooka. Not just a rocket launcher, but that weird unibike. Yeah, that she uses to literally ride up the wall. Mm-hmm. And which it, which is some, which is somehow a part of the big. They call it a tank, but it's more it's more like a big fucking armored truck. It's like that. It's like that arm. It's like that armored truck from. It's in it. It's not Day of the Dead, but it's but it's in that same series. I just can't remember the name off the top of my head. 
I know what you're talking about, Monk, but I don't remember the name either. No, it's um, it's definitely an APC that has a modular single wheel motorcycle that stows onto it to recharge, and is also still got an open top hatch for well, the one guy who doesn't have fucking f shooting weapons. Why would you stick the knife guy up there? Clearly these guys are not the smartest tools of the box. Clearly. <laughs> but the the problem the problem with tr the problem with trying to fire a, trying to fire a rocket is sometimes you have to deal with the debris which is the which is something Layla didn't learn. Um, D ends up pursuing, and we end up getting our first fight scene involving D and Meyer, where my where for Meyer his his weapon of choice is his wings, or rather his cape. He turns into wings. And of course, D's weapon of choice is what we have been seeing on his back this entire time. Mm -hmm. And God damn, is it glorious! <laughs> You're gonna carry out a sword that big. You better fucking use it. Yeah, and gr granted, there is a there there um there is a bit of distraction when Charlotte calls out for him, for calls out for Meyer, which result which um results in one of the one of the two complaint lines from Left Hand that gave that gave me a bit of a laugh, doing the whole slide and he's going ah my nose my nose. <laughs> Remember that left hand is on the palm of D's hand. If left hand is exposed, you're not dragging your palm across the ground. You're dragging left hand's face across the ground. And he's not going to be too happy about that if you do. Yeah, I will admit the other the other bit of of this kind of complaining that that I enjoy with I enjoyed his expense was the whole thing with the sand mantis. <laughs> He's like, uh, huge fucking sand mantis. Well, we, well, this is probably a dead end. We should probably turn back. Wait, where are you going? <laughs> and this is where the cyber horse thing comes into play. D jumps a horse probably 150 feet in midair. Mm -hmm. And then jumps it off of one gigantic sand manta ray onto another gigantic sand manta ray. And then jumps down in front of a third that almost eats him in the horse hole. And then keeps going. <laughs> yeah, which and this is this is one line that I have used infrequently in the years since. Have you ever heard the expression "too close for comfort"? Because that was damn uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but it. But the the next the next scene set up because we're kind, we're kind of following two different lines with the with two different pursuits. And it's here where we get where we learn that if whenever va whenever vampires feel threatened, they always run to the Barbaroi, which the is one of those things that is more ex the Barbaroi is something that's more explained in the books than than here. But it's gen but the Barbaroi could be described as the town of mutants and worse. It's a den of monsters. Mm -hmm. All the monsters you've seen from the darkest gothic horrors of mostly Western myth mm -hmm. are here. You got, you know, your werewolves, your changelings, your shadow people. You've got a creepy old man on a unicycle ball thing who's the leader of the Barbaroi. We also learned that the Barbaroi were employed thousands of years ago. In perpetuity, to assist vampires by the sacred ancestor. It's also revealed. It's also re now before we before we even before we even get to that point, the Marcus brothers try try to try to get try to beat D to the punch, getting to the Barbaroi, and end up running it. End up running into. The man, a freak we would later know as Bengi, who is a stealthy motherfucker. Watch the shadows. Which is how, no. we get, which is, which is how Nolt ends up get ends up getting done in because 
He doesn't get stabbed in the chest. His shadow he does gets get stabbed. stabbed in the chest. Yes. Also, we should probably take this time to talk about the voice cast for the movie at this point, because considering who voices Ben Gay, you kind of have to just laugh. Yeah, here's the thing: some of the some of the names that are involved that are involved with the voice cast, some people are probably going to be familiar with, but some of them a little less so. Um, yeah, D like, is is voiced by Andy Philpot, who. I don't think I don't think a lot of people when it comes to anime would be are get, are going to be familiar with him. Nah, he Go ahead. He doesn't have much to him in terms of anime work. I mean, he's got a fair amount of stuff. He's done stuff like Ninja Scroll, you know, eight gun uh Magical Girl Pretty Sammy, he did a couple uh did a role for and stuff like that. He did a lot of stuff in the old days. But as far as modern stuff, the closest thing that most people might know him is Lord Braska in Final Fantasy X. In fact, we got a lot of Final Fantasy X alumni in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, Meyer Link is-, is voiced by John Rafter Lee, who seems to be more of a, seems to be more of a film guy than a t- than than anything else. Although he was he was Sid in FF12, so. Keeping it, and, keeping on that trend, and he yeah. was Judai in Tenchi Muyo Ryooki, which, um, Andy Philpot also has te- also has Tenchi Muyo credits to his name. Yeah, his is in love though. Yeah, then then we get to Layla, voiced by Pamela Adlin, who, holy crap, we've got frick, oh my god, we got freaking Bobby Hill playing in this movie. And if I'm being on, if I'm being honest, um, maybe maybe she was just maybe she was just not all that experienced at the time when it came to this sort of voice acting, or th- or this was a direction thing. Um, I think pa- I think Pamela was was probably the we- was probably the weakest on the voice acting crew on the crew for this. Yeah, I mean, this was early on in her career. I mean, King of the Hill had just started coming out around this time. It just started blowing up. So it's understandable. But And it doesn't help when you're sitting next to people like Charlotte's voice actor, my gal, Wendy fucking Lee. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, for one, actually have never watched Bloodlust in English. Not even back when I very first watched it. I got it on DVD. It had the Japanese voice track and subtitles. So that's what I went with. So... You guys get some knowns and unknowns. I get people like Layla as Megumi fucking Hayashibara. Oh yeah, the oh yeah, the gr- the girl who ca- who what became a scavenger hunt for a few years because she kept showing up in everything I was watching. Lena yeah. Inverse, Ray Ayanami, female Ranma, Faye Valentine. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> I I when it comes to much straight there, Zan, I'm surprised. Uh, I well, if I kept going on, like a half hour of this show would just be all of Hayashibara's uh, fair, fucking. Fair. Now but... we can go over all the names, but there's at least three that we should bring up. There's one character coming up we haven't named yet, voiced by Mary, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who's always a trick treat to listen to. Mm-hmm. We have several characters, including Nolt. Uh, voiced by the ever so lovable Jean DiMaggio. Mm-hmm. Bite my shiny metal ass! Yeah. <laughs> and the reason I bring up the voice cast now is Ben Gay is voiced by a man by the name of Dwight Schultz. Folks, this mutant motherfucker was voiced by Reginald fucking Barclay! Or, um, even better, you know, Mad Murdoch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just figured I'd reach out to the Trekkies out there. <laughs> Mad, Mad Murdoch, and um, I'd be remiss if I did for for some of the for some of the younger crew, Doctor Animo and Ben Ten. Yeah. Oh. And some some of them will some of them will get will. 
we'll, cer we'll certainly get into. He was also the old man of Barbaroi, so he's pulling double duty. So he's getting twice as he's getting twice the paycheck. I mean, Dimaggio well, pulls yeah, like Dimaggio four people. Three fucking roll, uh, four fucking rolls in this movie. Yeah, and if you listen close, you can hear Scott McNeil laughing at us. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> he's not wrong. As someone who has been drinking buddies with the man, yeah, he would. He would totally laugh. But this is this is where then I have to again go back over to the uh, Japanese voice cast real, real quick. Um, we've got some like with just the Marcus brothers alone, we've got some names that people may not know but have probably heard. Uh, Borgoff is Yusaku Yada, who uh, has done things like Sagittarius in the original 1986 Saint Seiya, or uh, for example, Senbei Nori Norimaki in the 1997 Doctor Slump remake, Ironheart and Duel Monsters, etc. Mm -hmm. um, oh wow, he did the in, his most recent work was in the in the anime Platinum End as the God who was dying. Huh. Um, or my favorite, Kyle Marcus is Hochu Otsuka, and I've heard his voice everywhere, like. He's Cow in Elgheim. He's Yazan in Zeta Gundam. He's fucking uh, oh, uh, Tap in Dragnar. Yes, I'm naming mostly Mecha. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. Fight me. Um, <laughs> he's Chibode Crockett in G Gundam. The most American American who ever Americaned. With, yeah. the, with the most Japanese vocabulary ever. <laughs> but as you can see, when it comes to the Japanese side of things... Um, they didn't skimp on the cast. Even someone as small as the sheriff of a small town that they eventually that will eventually get to, who is voiced by John DiMaggio in English, is voiced by Shades Man Rikia Koyama. Oh yeah! <laughs> mm -hmm. So hey, Joker fans, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> It, my, my, my toker is live friends will know exactly where i'm going with that <laughs> yep it's it it's it's an all-star cast it is outright an all-star cast mm -hmm. even if even if uh someone like d himself hideyuki tanaka he's not someone that a lot of people will probably know uh you look at most of his his uh bits over the years He's been a lot of side characters, or characters who don't get a lot of speaking parts. For example, uh, he played Ray Earth in Magic Knight Ray Earth, so the voice of the giant fire mecha. Um, but he's he's always been someone at least somewhat important to plot. Mm -hmm. uh, Enrico Maxwell in Helsing. Um, I'll, I'll do you one better. Again, going back to our Toku fans. Uh, if you're an Ultraman fan... He's fucking Zofi. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's gotten big he's gotten a lot of shit throughout Ultraman history. Zofi and uh technically Ultraman the Next in the 2004 Ultraman movie. Yeah. But, but move but moving past that. Um you do have when it came, when it comes to the confrontation within the within the bar within the um, Barbaroi, within the within the Barbaroi village, I guess. Oh, the Barbaroi fortress town. That close enough. Oh, that the the Marcus brothers decide to use one of decide to use their trump card. That being Gro that being Grove, who is described as a psychic, but whenever I s whenever I saw Grove, I kept getting reminded of the old folktale about the Kresnik. Okay, I can see it. The way I've always described Grove um, is goes into a semi death state to become Laser Ghost. <laughs> Pretty much. That's what he is. He's a ghost that shoots fucking lasers of holy power. Mm -hmm. And it's tr it is tr it is treated that he like he's a last resort when it comes to when it comes to that particular stunt. But 
that ends up going that ends up going down um that ends up going south very quickly both 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 of uh, the Marcus brothers and D and D are giving pursuit D ends up getting trapped in one in one of Bengi's spells because his whole Bengi is the is a tricky motherfucker who likes to play illusions of it was cloth all along kind kind of this setting's equivalent to getting logged in Naruto <laughs> This is all. This is um also the point where we get a very very detailed horse vivisection because Bengi, yeah. Bengi uh <laughs> lures him off a cliff into the uh the darkness to fight him that turns into cloth and then traps him. Mm -hmm. But the horse does not get trapped with him. His cyber horse falls to the bottom of the cliff. And well, have you ever dropped a water balloon more than four feet, people? Oh Lord, yeah. We can very clearly see that some of this horse is still organic. A lot of this horse was still organic. Mm -hmm. Keyword <laughs> was. <laughs> I mean, it's still organic. It does. It does biodegrade. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, D does manage to get out by get by having left hand basically swallow the spell. But that does require D's interaction with the magic. Left hand couldn't have done it without D's help. Mm -hmm. um, he he even says, "You finally woken up enough to do this." Um, and again, that, that stems back to the fact that D has a lot of the magical powers that full nobles have, and he really shouldn't. Yeah. Although, although left hand, st left hand can't do it without complaining <laughs> this time, just complaining about it, about D being a slave driver. I mean, uh, left hand complains about everything. Yeah, I was gonna say, left hand complains about, well, name a noun. <laughs> just, just, just like you're a petty motherfucker in every day that ends in Y, he complains about everything in every day that ends in Y. Mm -hmm. Which, to be fair, is part of the charm. But <laughs> I, I do have to note that um, that left hand is actually voiced by the late great Ichiro Nagai. Mm -hmm. May he rest in peace. But uh. Yeah, this guy had a long and storied uh, uh, particular career as well. Ichiro Nagai, great voice actor, and I'm glad they got him for left hand for as long as they did. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, in the of course in the intervening time, you do have the remaining the remaining Marcus brothers managing to track down and avenge Bengi. I mean, Avenge, Avenge Nolt. Yeah, Avenge Nolt. What the, what the hell am I saying? Um, they kill Bengi eventually. Yeah. Kill him through long division. Yeah, Knife Guy finally gets his chance. Mm -hmm. And thus, Bengi became half the man he used to be. Yep. Uh, of course, he would be killed by a Kyle. <laughs> Must have had his energy drink that day. But then. The, but the well, but it is a fearic victory because well, in the during the chase, um, one of the other one of the other bodyguards from Meyer Link, uh, the a shape a shapeshifter named Caroline, decide decided to get get a little spiky within the tank. Yeah, she uh she turned into road spikes, hmm. the extreme version. Where these spikes don't spike your tires, they spike your entire car. There were holes in the whole thing. Very barely missing Layla or Grove. Um, and sc uh, scarring up Kyle and Borgoff. Um, this, this is actually what, inspired, what ha forced them to get out and fight Bengi in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, they, need, they needed to refuel, but there was a, t there was a town that's not too far off. Which is where we get an, where, where we get a bit more context regarding regarding D regarding D, along with a few um, old Western motifs. Yeah, the whole place is very much a Western city mm -hmm. or a Western town. They've got a normal saloon and everything, and an asshole sheriff. An asshole sheriff, because Dampier, our curses, everything must go away. I'm a racist. Fuck you. Um, he, uh, 
he at first it, the first person to get there is actually Layla because the for some reason while the rest of the tank was destroyed the unicycle was not uh and she sees D walking holding the saddle of his horse and goes hmm how do i make his life more difficult and so she goes into the uh into the saloon and yes it is a proper saloon flaunting her gun on her hip um asks her something to drink the sheriff shows up uh the sheriff is like i'm gonna confiscate your weapon she points it at his face a set for a second before turning it around and handing it to him uh <laughs> handing it to him the proper way you hand a gun to people mm -hmm. uh that was actually i i always liked that little detail that it was proper yeah um and then says you've got so much free time to come after little old me what about the damn beer that just came into your city and they're like wait what <laughs> just as he just as he's about to saddle up a new horse after after bu after buying it for a pretty penny if, if pennies were made of gold <laughs> it's like 200,000 US dollars in gold coins or the equivalent thereof um but before he could finish saddling up the sheriff and his posse show up to the this old man, old man Polk, I think his name was. Um, yeah. A, a, and they're like, nope, you can't have the horse. Get the hell out of here. You're a damn peer. We don't serve your kind. Mm -hmm. um, and Polk is just like, hey, dude, fuck you. This is my, this is my business. He already paid. Let him take it. Yeah. Uh, Polk being voiced by the late, by the late John Hostetter. Yep. Who? But. Interesting. Interestingly enough, Hostetter seems to have more um, television role than he does animated roles. That's not surprising. Now, something interesting about this exchange, Polk starts to tell a story about how their village once hired a vampire hunter that saved their children who were kidnapped. Um, and it was a damn peer hunter then as well. And it turns out this old man has met D before, uh, was one of the children saved by D. And the most interesting thing about this interaction was that this was actually a callback to the story told in Vampire Hunter D 1985 and its adaptation. This is actually a callback to that story. It's not a direct callback. It's only a, a, an illusion. Allusion, starting with A, people, not illusion, starting with I. Um, but I thought that was the coolest thing, because when I originally watched these movies, I watched them back-to-back, -back, having rented both from from Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, Vampire Hunter D, Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust. I'm like, it looked like we are made by two different people, and they were. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my little brain was just like, oh, they're, they're speaking in cool ways and doing cool shit. I like this. <laughs> But the uh, the old man pulls this godforsaken abomination of a giant, heavy-ass, blunderbuss-looking rifle in the in the sheriff's face and says, "He's gonna buy that horse now. Get saddle up and go before my arms let go of this thing." Mm -hmm. I love the whole bit. It's my favorite. Yeah, and to be to be fair, you know how we've we've talked about some. Um about this about this movie dipping into motifs of of gothic of gothic horror and spoiler warning although spo although the spoiler mandate is passed it's not the last time that there's going to be the, is going to be dipping into that but in here we have a lot of old west motifs and that's the reason why I call this kind of thing a gestalt mhm mm oh and as some as somebody who's made it very clear that one of his fa one of his favorite RPG series is Wild Arms, I approve of these kind of guest alts. But sh it's shortly after that that you do have the you do have that confrontation with Charlotte and D, where it's revealed that 
this wasn't exactly a kidnapping as we were initially led to believe. Mm hmm. And D is actually, because of his conversation with Charlotte, even more determined. Mm -hmm. Because as left hand um, doesn't even imply, he states outright, you want to stop them because you don't want another of you being made. Um, of course, Layla follows D because that's all Layla can really do. Yeah, and is far is far less of a conversationalist about the matter. It's like I'm going to take you now. We're going to leave, and then of course the shapeshifter Caroline and the werewolf uh, Makira both show up again. Mm -hmm. Which Caroline is the, Caroline is the one who ends up engaging, which seems like an even fight, and then. The Chekhov's gun from earlier decides to choose now of all times to fire. That being the whole sunsickness. Yep. Back in the back during the desert and the and the and the sand mantas and all of that, uh, left hand was like, "You need to rest. You're gonna suffer sunsickness. You know, if you want to die, don't take me with you." <laughs> mm -hmm. And. That's that is where things get that is where things get at their worst, um, and he and him having to focus on bear, on trying to bury himself. Although it although it, even though he succeeds in that, and and has a bit of a beheading moment with Caroline, apparently that isn't enough to to take her out because that's where we got the one attempt to jump scare in the whole damn film. <laughs> yeah, he he's he's successful in his fight with her, and then he is rushing to try and bury himself and nearly actually very nearly fails. But <clears throat> Layla, having a change in conscious with all the conscience with all the way that uh D has been treating her with nothing but cool respect as he does with everybody else, mm -hmm. except for those who aggress against him. Very much an, an, a small L libertarian in that respect. <laughs> I had to make that joke. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, she she doesn't understand why he either uh, didn't kill her when he had the chance while they were all conflictory as as two different hunter groups when uh, the shrapnel from earlier. Uh, nearly got her killed uh, with her rocket launcher. And he ac actually treated her wounds. He didn't bite her or anything, and she was afraid of that, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, she finishes burying him to help him. And they have a little heart-to-heart -heart where Layla talks about uh, what happened or with start her mother. Well, no, that's after she has her next fight she talks about how they're both hunters and uh and but before she can get really far into it uh caroline pulls her up by her neck trying to kill her um in the middle of a giant thunderstorm at the top of a tree and then layla stabs her in the head with a knife metal high point thunderstorm I'm yeah. sure you can imagine what happens next. Yeah. Where is Akadaka when I need it? <laughs> I, I have to I have to call out the plot synopsis on Wikipedia for this. Survives only by chance when lightning strikes the mutant, killing her instantly. First of all, this shapeshifter it's implied from the way that she shapeshifts at first. She can turn into other uh materials as she did when she turned into spikes in the tank. But it always looks like she starts out as wood, as if she's some sort of dryad mutant. Which, um, given her appearance, her being dryad adjacent would certainly make sense. Yeah, all that green. Mm -hmm. So, lightning strikes, strike knife handle in head of wooden being. It's just like when a uh, tree gets struck by lightning, guys. She explodes and catches fire. 
it's at this point that after that fight, uh, Layla does have that part where she talks about her past. Specifically uh, the fact that her mother was kidnapped by a vampire, and then her mother came back, but she was already changed. And the other villagers had her killed. On top of that, her her mother came back only after her father went out to find her, but her father neither, never came back, mm -hmm. implying he was killed on his journey. And... She want she wanted to get vengeance for that. She ended up she ended up running away from her home, and joining the Marcus brothers. And Dee's response to the whole thing is that the life of a hunter isn't the life isn't a life for you. And that's where Layla makes her joke of, "Hey, if I die first, you come to my grave and put flowers on it. And if you die first, I'll come to your grave and put flowers on it." And D agrees. And as it's as far as as far as what as far as why he'd e why he'd even consider that kind of thing. Oh, all all his response is that he's a damn fear. He doesn't get to have a life. Oh, and it it kinda, cannot live as a human. Yeah, it kind of carries this implication that. He do, that he doesn't like anybody dipping dipping into this profession, not because he wants all the glory for him, for himself, but because there's a whole lot more that humans can do that he can't. He is consigned to what he believes as his eternal and only role to end this curse of the nobles versus humans. However that may be. He thinks that humans themselves should pursue happiness in, in whichever way it takes them. Yeah. But past the, but past that, that's where we've, I'd be. I think the next thing that we'd have to bring up is the bridge scene where it's revealed where exactly the carriage is heading towards. Because there's been hints that. That there is that there is some benefactor who's been helping out Meyer, even mm -hmm. to, even to the point where it's where it's implied that the Barbaroi were hired by someone else to protect the carriage. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get our first clue of it that it's th that they're heading to the castle of Chafe. The castle that was that was um ha that was the per the personal housing of Carmilla, a name that I'm pretty that I'm pretty sure anybody familiar with vampire lore is go is going to is going to hear and be like, oh that bitch. Ah, uh, Carmilla. Except in in this in this particular setting, she's a combination of two famous vampires. Because she's been given the last name of Bathory, i.e., Urzabet Bathory. And you know how you know how we talked about a lot of FF10 alumni. <laughs> she's voiced by she's voiced by Julia Fletcher, who was Unaleska in FF10. Fitting. Oh. Uh. She was also she was also um ju she was also Judge Drace in tw in twelve. So she, so that's so add that one to the pile. Yep. <sighs> but the bridge scene is where is where is where is 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 where we get rev where we get a bit of revelation of two things one. That the whole the whole love bet between Meyer Link and Charlotte is act is actually real because it's it's so, the sun is going down but it is not down yet mm -hmm. and the plan the the brothers have is bomb the bridge threaten these people that they're going to bomb it further if they don't do exactly what they say and uh, they get a hold of. Charlotte. And they also ostensibly 
defeat our werewolf friend as well. Uh, but it's at this point that the door opens to the carriage, and Meyer Link steps out into sunlight. It's not it's not direct sunlight. It is the sunset. Mm-hmm. It's not overhead high noon. He'll burn to death in seconds. But he is catching fire because he does not want to leave her. Mm-hmm. And this is all. And this is also where it's revealed that the. The Marcus brothers have a bit of a sadistic side because they are laughing it up at see at seeing him get set on fire. <laughs> for a ver- for a for quite a lengthy amount of time. And they mm-hmm. make him feel it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Kyle also makes some really uh off color remarks about having fun with a uh, Charlotte later as well. And this is where you this is where you once again shouldn't tempt the gods of irony because the last mem- the last member of the of that entourage protecting the carriage decides to show up and he's the one who is high up on the don't fuck with me list. Yep. Makira took a dive earlier. And I mean that literally, he dived off the bridge. Um but he did so because just before he was attacked and thrown off the bridge, he used his werewolf senses to determine where all the bombs the brothers had placed were on the bridge. He used the time he was away to actually grab the bombs and take them off, and then comes up and fucking curb stomps Kyle immediately. Kyle is dead. And not Irony, just it's dead, usually very, very mutilated. Mm-hmm. Irony, it's usually Kenny in these situations. <laughs> but and I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Makira is another character in this th- in this thing voiced by John DiMaggio. Man got around on this one. <laughs> As Scott McNeil eloquently put it at Metricon one time, John DiMaggio is quite the polyphonic prostitute. <laughs> Scott McNeil's the one throwing stones in glass houses with that fucking statement. <laughs> oh no, he's he said that about himself. Yeah. But he, but ah. it's gone just as much. Mm-hmm. Well, so long as they're getting paid, right? <laughs> That's why he said it called himself that. Yeah, he'll take any role, even if it's a dumb one. As long as he's getting paid, he'll be a polyphonic prostitute any day. Mm-hmm. But while 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 Makira stays behind to f- to fight D, that doesn't last long. And that's where over in one flash. <laughs> Which seems to be seems to be a recurring thing with a lot of the f- fights that Link isn't involved in. It's usually a one shot. Yeah, uh, all of the Sakuga that we've gotten has either been the uh, the particular uh, like introducing the powers of of the of the Marcus brothers, or when Grove got his chance to shine, mm-hmm. or any time D fights for longer than one second. <laughs> Like when he fought against, uh, when he fought against Caroline. Yeah, Caroline. Mm-hmm. So many C names, so little time. Yeah. Um. The 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 Marcus brothers have gotten a couple, um, but I wouldn't say that the the ambush by Bengi was any sort of moment of true Sakuga. It was o- over and done in in moments. Mm-hmm. The second fight against Bengi after. Uh, both the chase itself and the actual fight with Bengi was superb Sakuga. Mm-hmm. But, but at this point, it's it's revealed who actually hired them, that being Carmilla. Mm-hmm. Carmilla, uh, Meyer Lincoln and, and Charlotte are talking about why they're going to this castle. They're trying to reach a vampire mecca known as the City of the Night, which lies beyond the stars. As in, this is like a vampire city in space. Mm-hmm. Remember how we said that this is way in the far-flung future and is both post-apocalyptic and like post-cyberpunk? Uh, yeah, space travel. And I, I do want to note that the there's a, there's a lot of very, very good backdrops and very, very good background art with within this film. 
the peak of that is the Castle of Chafe. Yeah, Castle Chafe is super fucking cool looking. Mm. You've got the gothic flying buttresses and, and all the all that fun stuff that you would expect. But because this is a castle meant to launch rockets, not ro a rocket, rockets, it had multiple rocket ports, it's gigantic. And it's also much more fortified than most gothic castles. It looks so fucking cool. The other thing... Of course, this is also where we get a bit of exposition regarding... Um, Carmilla, and it's what you might expect. She was crazy bitch. She was a crazy bitch who was a, who was ridiculously vain. Um, she 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 ended up get she ended up getting so out of hand with her, with with her with her particular bloodlust that she that she got staked by the vampire king. Yep, the the sacred ancestor, the vampire king himself, put that bitch in a coffin. It's like, I'm, I'm me, and I think you're a little much. Mm -hmm. Bitch, we are not looking to wipe out humans and they are, uh, or make them livestock, and you don't ever fucking listen to me with your fucking noble superiority complex. So, uh, sleep, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> Although, in this exposition, which is handled by, the, by left hand, he gives, he gives the remark of, but you don't care about any of that. I know what really gets to you, and tries to play psych warfare. Of I know, I know, I know who you are. I know how you think. I know everything about you, and all he gets is just a squeeze. Yeah, uh, I know that it's none, that none of this is the real motivation. It's and this is where uh, this is actually where left hand actually spells it out. You're trying to stop those two so they don't create another one of you. Mm -hmm. That literally, that's almost verbatim his words. Um, and then, of course, D, riding his horse and thus clutching reins, just grabs his his left hand a little tighter than his right, and you hear you hear <laughs> from uh, from left hand. A <laughs> little bit of pain, a little bit of what the fuck are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, but e but Eve and the the um. The scenes of going th of going through the castle very much have the same vibe of go of going through of going through the castle early on in Dracula, which which certainly certainly makes sense. And it's only later on that th that things start to, that think that Carmilla's true intentions start to slowly get revealed through a little scene that could be considered mind fuckery. I mean, it's only Wonka's ship from the fucking Gene Wilder movie, Monk. <laughs> One of the biggest WTF moments in in films for us as as youngins. <laughs> no, no child expected something that fucking creepy in such a happy-go-lucky movie. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the big thing is um, the culmination. Carmilla says, hey, yeah, okay, so I'll help prepare the ship to get you to the City of the Night, and, uh, you, you know, it'll take a little time, so you two just take some time to rest now that you're safe. Mm -hmm. And they go up into a drawing room, and they're standing together, and Myers having trouble uh, holding back with his fangs, and Charlotte is willing to take it, and he says something extremely poignant, that an eternal life is not what he wishes for her. Because it is empty, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he feels like he senses something. He's like, there's some unfinished business. Stay here, I'll be back. And that's, <sighs> where, the, that's where the elute, that's where the mindfuckery starts to begin. Yep. Because... First off, you have you have Meyer having the mindfuckery of D showing up and taking Charlotte away. Complete yeah, with, complete with him get complete with him getting stabbed. Yeah, it was more than stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So this scene is actually a pretty pretty nice one. Meyer is suddenly flying through what looks like a a um pillared hull. It looks like there's light coming through pillars on one side. So you have the shadows with the beams of white between them. Um and he stops and he sees D uh, as he comes around the corner of like a large staircase and sees D with something under his cloak. And he opens his cloak and D says something like, she's coming home with me. And she, and she's crying. And so, first of all, you're thinking, wait, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. The, the audience at this point is thinking, wait, what the fuck? Didn't you just, did you just leave her in the fuck? With, and D has... And, she, and he's using her as a hostage? What the fuck? And Meyer Link, as he's about to go all out, um, does the phrase splitting headache mean anything to y'all? Because <laughs> that's what he has. Don't, i.e. what Tex had when he tried to join the four leader club. <laughs> and so Meyer Link seems to be down for the count. Mm-hmm. But not Count Dracula. And Char- Charlotte get goes through the massive fucking staircase, which is which results in its in its own bit of mind fuckery. Um, a staircase she sees through a mirror of all things. Yeah, that's a, that's as good of a sign as any that um that mi- that um again mind fuckery. To quote Cipher. <clears throat> Hold on, Toto, because Kansas is going bye bye. <laughs> but the I'd, the I'd say the I I there is one other bit of mind fuckery going going about in the fact that somehow Borgoff manages to make it into the castle, and in the midst of all of this mind fuckery, he sees his brothers. His dead brothers. Mm-hmm. They, they're even coming out of coffins. And he and he is too blind. He is too blinded by it to realize what's going. What's actually going on? Until he's speared through the back mm-hmm. by a few of his own arrows. I think it was. Yeah. Late later co- later coming back in the later coming back in the form of a vampire. Mm-hmm. Layla also has her own illusion where she sees herself in front of her mother's grave as a child. Mm-hmm. And even Dee gets the illusion treatment. But Dee's is a little different. Dee is confronted by a vision of his mother. And unlike everyone else, his mother starts talking and he cuts her the fuck down. Which later causes Carmilla to say the best, one of the best lines, I think. I don't know what vision you saw, but you were able to cut that which cannot be cut and should not be cut. Mm -hmm. Implying that he's so heartless he can cut down anything. Where it's more likely, again, due to Dee's magical nature that he shouldn't have, he knew, he already knew it was an illusion and knew where the nexus to dispel it was. Yeah. And it's through this that it's revealed what what Carmilla's actual plan was, because Carmilla herself has been de- has been dead for centuries. The Carmilla we've been seeing has been an illusion projection the entire time. Uh, an illusion by Carmilla's ghost. Yep. And. She decides to tr- she decides to try and take out D herself. But to do so, she tries to revive her corporeal body, mm-hmm. which is what she needed Charlotte for. Because well, more, that's more blood for her. Well, it was the blood that she needed. Mm-hmm. Um, without that blood, she wasn't able going going to be able to revive her body. Mm-hmm. And. The thing, the thing, of course, the, of course, um, Carmilla does does doesn't quite realize what exactly she's fucking with, 
because the attempt the attempt to blast just ends up backfiring on her and we get a reaffirmation of D's motivation basically that va that vampires need to be exterminated yeah uh, along the way when Borgoff does reappear as a vampire mm -hmm. he he takes Layla a hostage before D can go off to uh, confront Carmilla. Mm -hmm. And Grove appears in his holy ghost form, clings to Borgoff and self-destructs, killing them both. Mm -hmm. And this time, for Grove, it's permanent. He yeah. put a lot more of the drug into his veins that puts him in that state in the first place just so he could save her. Which ultimately means that all of we may as well we may as well have given red, we may as well have given red colored uniforms to every member of of the Marcus family because except all, Layla because Layla's the only one who survives. Yeah. So I I guess being I guess this is the equivalent of being named Hojo in a more traditional anime. <laughs> Oh. Or being named Shinji, for that matter. Mm. Yes. But you do have you do have a two pronged thing with Meyer Link destroying Carmilla's physical body and D destroying her spirit. In fact, essentially, essentially swallowing it whole because, well. Left hand's got to eat. And he's got a bigger <laughs> appetite than me. But this is but even with even with this, obviously D still has a job to do. And this is where we get the la the last proper fight in the movie. Which isn't a, isn't as much um exchanging of blows. In fact, there's a whole there's several. There's several seconds worth of blade locking, essentially, to the point to the point where to the point where the to the point where the weapons start getting red. Yep. And then Meyer's wing starts cracking. Mm -hmm. But the the this this uh battle is already after the climax. The climax is done and over. What this battle is, is finishing the job, and Layla, who has been massively changed by the events of this entire ordeal, uh, is like, can we just, neither of you were bad, both of you are good, please just stop. <clears throat> and, uh, she, uh, she's begging them to stop especially since it is at this point that charlotte expires from the massive uh exsanguination from carmilla mm -hmm. um and the wedding ring that was on her finger from meyer the one that he gave her because you don't need to become a vampire please just be you know be be human and love me, and that's all I'll need. Is it what it boiled down to? Mm -hmm. And he, uh, she throws the ring down to them, and D deliberately, after he gets the advantage and actually gets through Meyer's cape, deliberately does not stab Meyer in the heart. Oh, he still gets skewered. He still gets fucking impaled, but he. He missed the heart on purpose. Mm -hmm. taking that's the, that's what. Taking the ring as proof. Proof that it's over. She's dead. They'll pay me. Mm -hmm. No one left. And in the aftermath, um, Meyer ta Meyer decides to board the, board the rocket and ta and take off into with um. Charlotte's body and take off into the city of night. And 
I think actually this that scene that final that final scene at the castle mm-hmm. where you see the rocket starting to take off and Layla is with all her might fly damn you fly mm-hmm. um and you the, like it looks like the engines are starting to fail and it looks like it's not going to make it and then it does it's this idea that uh there is some sort of redemption absolution if you only try hard enough and believe in it mm-hmm. now with in the aftermath it, it ends up skipping forward to several years after a funeral is held for Layla with a with a huge crowd among that mm. is Layla's granddaughter who recognizes D uh, I guess because Layla had told stories about it about D and invites invites him to spend time with the family but he says no he's because just, D yeah He's just glad D- that he was wrong. Yeah. D D deliberately tells this girl, "I'm only here to fulfill a ho- an old promise, but it looks like it isn't necessary." Um. And D's refusal to hang out with them is because is it always goes back to his his one uh, assertion that he he's not allowed to have a life as a human or a vampire. But that at least someone he knew was able to get out of the hunter life and live in a happy state. Mm-hmm. And of course, of course, um, the the one person who gets the last word in all of this is Left Hand with that old, "No, oh, you're not that bad of a guy. You just dress bad." In the in the English version, in the Japanese version, he's like, "I never thought you were so soft and sentimental." <laughs> um, jury's out about which jury's out about which version is better in that regard, but the thing that I the thing that I find in the thing that I find interesting is that this I think the I think part of the reason that this is a labor of love. Oddly enough, has a lot to do with Kikuchi, because the there was a, apparently there was a lot of fan demand for a follow up to the eighty five film, and Kikuchi was a man of strong opinions of that film, and called and called the look cheap. Which. I can kind of understand. Yeah, it's a case of, well, he's not entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. And something, I do find it kind of interesting that this was an international project where a lot of the post-production was actually done in the States. Mm -hmm. And the the English soundtrack was done before the Japanese dialogue was finished. Yeah, uh, the the theatrical release was in English only with Japanese subtitles in Japan. And as far as far as the question of why we never saw the subtitle, um, that was a last minute thing. But with, even even with ev- even with everything that we mentioned, I c- I can't help but I can't help but wonder if. Kikuchi was a little bit more hands-on in terms of being in terms of being a consultant. Mm-hmm. It's something that I could see, or there's just the fact that Ka- that Kawajiri knows what the hell he's doing. Probably a little of both. But this is this is where we infor- this is where we unfortunately have some ish- some issues because you know how we you know how we ranted a, f- a a couple weeks ago about the fact that there is no str- there is no streaming service hosting Samurai X Yeah, we're dealing with the same problem here. 
<sighs> Why is it all these beloved classics are so hard to get a hold of anymore? Uh, using the site that I, I'm pretty sure that you've mentioned before and that uh, Monk and I used when discussing this earlier, Just Watch. Um, and looking up Vampire Hunter D, well, we look up the Bloodlust movie, there's not a single streaming service offered. Not to mention, the trailer that they have from YouTube is definitely not from the corrected DVD stuff that we, uh, that we watched. Just, yeah. Oh man, that is bit crushed to hell and back. Oh, that's bad. But yeah, so basically this means that you're either going to have to pay out the ass for a, for a copy of the DVD or Blu-ray, or ladies and gentlemen, it's once again time, as much as I hate to say it, to sail the high seas. <laughs> The U.S. distribution was handled by Urban Vision, who Urban Vision, much like manga, much like manga entertainment and U.S. Manga Core, were big pioneers in the early days of of um, U.S. distribution in the '90s. But as time, but as time went on, and there was that three-way battle in the t in the 2000s between um ge between Genion, AD. ADV and um to let's see who's the th I keep th I keep forgetting who the third part who the third one in that in that scramble was but that huge huge scramble in the 2000s they didn't license a whole lot of stuff and eventually they were acquired by right stuff and right stuff didn't do a whole lot in that time peri time period as the 2000s rolled on And unfortunately, this is one of this is one of the many works that kind of got lost in the shuffle. A lot of Urban Vision's old work has gotten picked up by Retro Crush, I think, but not enough. And look, this is this is one of those cases where if there was if there was a if if there was a Blu-ray release by Discotech tomorrow, I would be willing to take back a lot of the bitching that I have regarding this kind of thing. But that hasn't happened yet. If it do if it does, I will happily take it back and and I'll and hell, I'll even link the thing once a proper link so people can so people can actually buy the thing comes around. For whatever reason, though, the mo the movie is avail is still available in its entirety on YouTube if you want to look. And also watch it in terrible quality. Yeah. Oh, I'm not. I'm. I'm just putting that out there as an as an option. There is something on the high on the high seas. If you want, oddly enough, the best quality, the one that Zan and I have have recently watched, which we may we may as well go into that particular work of insanity. Just without um, just without obviously naming any names. Yeah, sure. Hold on, I'll pull that up again. So, on this particular work, the uh, remuxer, I guess I'll call them, the re-encoder, um, states, first, the observations they made, which they based all of their changes and filtering on. Uh, DVD f uh, the DVD film is overexposed at places. The Blu-ray has bad grain and complete it's completely destructive. It, on the Blu-ray, the darks are completely crushed. The Blu-ray has bad, bad color tints in green, blue, and yellow in different scenes. The Blu-ray has worse color grading than the DVD or has no color grading at all. The Blu-ray is horribly shaky. The Blu-ray has a lot of broken frames in the forms of things like burns, holes, glues, etc. The Blu-rays have some digital sampling artifacts due to the production, and the Blu-ray has terrible blooming due to a bad transfer. This re-encoder, uh, for their fixes, they matched the DVD to... Uh, video to the blu-ray video by frame count uh they spot fixed broken frames over 10,000 spot and film defects on more than 20,000 frames they shifted the colors and levels according to their judgment and they have a section later for what color grading they decided to use uh, they fixed the, the chroma shifts and bleeds 
Uh, they stabilized as much of the shaky Blu-ray as they could. Uh, the DVD was completely cleaned up and adjusted for best merging. Uh, they fixed combed frames, even though all frames were progressive. Mm -hmm. They nearly completely removed the bad grain found on the Blu-ray. Uh, they merged the good DVD b details into the Blu-ray. Uh, they restored most of the black coloring. They, si they fixed the digital sampling artifacts. Uh, they fixed some of the animation defects. And they fixed most of the bloom issue. The color grading they used is snow is white, moon is white, vampires are a gray, teeth are white, blood is red. Bright sun and clouds are white. Uh, the sand is whitish. Dawn and dusk are orange and orange and red. Clouds are also orangish reddish at those times. The bright scenes are bright, not grayish, to make it look more natural since they don't have any true reference material. And they also note that there are some improvements they could make to the video still, such as some of the blurring from the merged DVD details. Um, the video is still really dirty on the Blu-ray side of things, and there are a lot more spots to clean up. Uh, some individual frames are still quite shaky, and there are a few frames where they themselves made mistakes for the filtering, just a little bit. Now, I do want to I do want to slightly correct myself. Apparently, the the um the Blu-ray the, there is a Blu-ray version available that was apparently licensed by Sentai. Um, I found a Amazon link for it that's around twenty bucks. But given what we just said about the Blu-ray version, maybe maybe you're better off with this Remux. Um, that be that being said, I do think it. I do think it is nevertheless criminal that it isn't available on any, on any streaming service. You would have you would. Given given recent events, you would have at least thought it'd be available on High Dive, but our searches turned up nothing. Yeah, it is. It's worse than criminal, in my particular opinion. There there is a loss of something that absolutely needs to be preserved because these are not offered places that have the sort of access you would want to keep something properly preserved. Mm. There's not even like any indication that this is in some sort of digital film archive as a piece of history. Which it absolutely deserves to be considered because like this is a classic in every sense of the term. Yeah. Which speaking of that, after going through this fi this film with a fine tooth comb, I think it is time for us to render judgment. So, Actually, Monk, there's one last point I would like to make, because we didn't bring it up. Go ahead. The soundtrack. Yes. Especially given in the last two episodes, we ended up bitching about, we ended up bitching positively and negatively about sound design, even though one person tried to claim that, that they could hear your turn to roll in Vox Machina, which... It is a free country, and you're free to be wrong, and that that doesn't distract from my from the point we were making in that inaugural episode. Oh, I outright stated you can just barely hear it, and and to a casual audience, they're not going to easily catch it. And even if you could hear it, that doesn't that um that is only incidental to my to the point I was trying to make at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. So my my biggest point about the. Uh, Vampire Hunter D OST is it does have an identity. It's a very distinct identity, mm -hmm. but it is also a subdued one. The music is not there to uh, set the pace m more than, say, the actual film is. The music is there to lend an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's it's underneath rather than be than being on top of. As the as the case has been with the previous two parliaments. No, there's this long scenes. There's entire scenes where there isn't any scoring, which is yes. a, a restraint that I always appreciate. Uh, yes, and th that isn't to say that this is bad. This is this is to the effect of the movie and suits it. And so I thought that it was important to point that out, especially since we have been harping on music. Mm -hmm. 
pardon the pun, <laughs> uh, and, for uh, and spoiler warning, we're not we're not going to be stopping when it comes to harping on music. I think that's going to be a key thing that we that we discuss in future parliaments. Of course, oh, but yeah. I felt it was extremely important to bring that up before we did finally render judgment. So with that uh, with that said, I think it. It is time. It is time to get to our final judgments. So All right. Do the honors. Well, ladies and gentlemen, watching us, the Parliament of Geeks, it is that time once again. We ask the eternal question: Be it weeb or scrub, and as such, though you have not had as much chance to shine as usual today, Brother Shades, what is your judgment? <laughs> Yes, I let you two handle this because you guys uh, understand this movie a lot better than I do, even though I'm certainly no uh, slouch in that regard. That being said, for more modern tastes, this might be a bit of a challenge for you because it is very much a product of its time, but it is still, to this point, timeless. This is a classic and one that I would honestly consider to be in that category of anime that you must watch if you want to consider yourself a true hardcore anime fan. It is a great story. The art is exquisite and has aged like fine wine as opposed to rotting cheese like a lot of other old school anime tend to be. It has a very s subtle soundtrack that will carry you along and it has an interesting cast of characters who can be down... Can can act cool, but when it is time to be bombastic, my god, can they be bombastic and over the top. So thus, I would be a fool to not declare this anime anything else. Gentlemen of the Parliament, I declare Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust to be weeb! Alright, the first vote is in. Brother Shade sees Bloodlust as weeb. So you... Mildra, what is your particular? Be it weeb or be it scrub? Vampire Hunter D is it is a setting that I feel that even to this day I feel I feel hasn't been fully hasn't been fully explored in in cross me in cross media and in visual media as much as it should be. I do take some solace in the fact that it's gotten qu it's gotten quite a bit of the recognition it deserves in the form of sequential art, but it e even with that, I still feel like there could be more done. Now, with but with that in mind, Bloodlust, it even though it even though there are several changes from the light novel, much to its benefit. It is it, it it very much is Vampire Hunter D through the lens of Kawajiri. And a lot of Kawajiri's habits do shine through if you know where you're looking. Mm -hmm. Well there there are a there are a couple mismatches when it comes to when it comes to plot, but only things that you would have to really squint for. And only one voice performance that is not as good as everybody else. But even even but those are minor among minor complaints. That's the it's the equivalent of putting the thing out under an electron microscope. And well what when's the last time you saw one of those just lying about? <laughs> I hesitate to answer because I have actually been in universities with electron microscopes. Yeah, then you should know that they're fucking huge. Yeah, but they're always lying about monk. Anyways, <laughs> given given that, and especially even with the frustrations of it not being available on on any streaming service, I still think that anyone who is not just a fan of anime, but also a fa also a fan of horror in general and gothic horror in particular, owes it to themselves to watch this particular movie. Thus, the thus the monk declares that this is weeb. 
All right, two for two. Both the Shades and the Monk have decided that Bloodlust is weeb. As for myself, I would say that I probably nearly outspoke the Monk this episode. Uh, it's clear that I have a deep and utter respect and love for Vampir Vampire Hunter D in general and this movie in specific. Uh, that being said, the lack of any particular <clears throat> above-board way of viewing this particular movie is criminal, as Monk put it. The movie is going to be tough for newer crowds to anime because of the quiet moments i think there are going to be people who don't get it but if you can get past your predilections and peccadillos and actually synchronize with how bloodlust performs you will see the wider beauty of vampire hunter d through the lens of film the score is fantastic and used in the ways it needs to be used the voice acting, whether in English or in Japanese, apparently the English is actually really good. And the Japanese, as I made full disclosure of earlier, is a bunch of superstars. Finally, if you do seek out that corrected version that I detailed the corrections from, and I definitely encourage you to find it, though I cannot direct you there myself, um, it is better than even my memories of the DVD I rented in its visual style because it has had all of those flaws stripped away. And it gives you that intrinsic, quintessential value of this movie. In which case, once again, the Parliament is unanimous. I declare Bloodlust to be weeb, and with a count of three weeb and no scrub, this Parliament of Geeks finds Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust to be weeb. Now, as a bit of a as a bit of a follow up, I will I will note the following. V while. The original 1985 film and Bloodlust are the on are unfortunately the only film adaptations or or animated adaptations period of Vampire Hunter D. As I mentioned earlier on, there are quite there are quite a few and there are, there are quite a few comic book entries uh, and adaptations of Vampire Hunter D. Most most recently was a was an adaptation of an unpublished Kikuchi story called Message from Mars, which unfortunately un, was on um, was on was in um kick was in Kickstarter through an omnibus, but the, but if you dig around, you should be you should be able to find the thing, and I've I've even found copies on eBay for a decent amount. It is go and even with that, as I've mentioned in the past, there are there have been other comic book adaptations. Some of them going in different directions. Some of them being adaptations of Kikuchi's novels. The point is, is that much like with a lot of pulp characters, especially characters like Conan and Red Sonia, the best, some of the best breadth of experience you're going to get is through um, comics. Unfortunately, there's far too many links for me to put in the description, but just in the word... Actually, you know what? Shades, do you have the Google button? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to find this stuff, do us all a favor and take the, take the Joe Bob challenge. Google that fucker. You should always just Google that fucker. <laughs> <laughs> and with that in mind... I'd say th I'd say that wraps up with a nice little bow this particular episode of the Parliament of Geeks. Another three three ones in another classic. The next time will be something we've been planning for a bit more of a long term thing, but that, as they say, is a story for another day. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, and on behalf of the Parliament of Geeks. My name is Mildra, and I wish you all a good day. 
See you next time.